So great to be at this meeting again. Great Wednesday. It's good to hear all the voices singing. There's nothing like it. Music is good, but someone singing a cappella is even better. So just going to get straight into this talk as time's moving on. If you guys wanted to turn with me with your Bibles, whatever they may be, phone or paper Bible, if you wanted to turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. And we'll pick it up in verse 15. And I'm going to read down to verse 23. When everybody's read. Okay. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For the day that you eateth thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, to all the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not help, not found a help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh indeed thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made him a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Uh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And they were both naked, down in verse 25. And, uh, yeah, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So... God created a, a garden, filled it with mankind, put them in charge of maintaining it, whatever that, that involved, mowing the lawn, whatever it was, supplied them with everything they needed from food, produce, and water to, for drinking, you know, told them, you can do whatever you want in the garden. You can eat of whatever you want. Just don't go near a specific tree, you know? or you will suffer the consequences. What a great position and a wonderful position that God put Adam and Eve in with only a small price to pay for it. You can touch anything, eat anything you want in the garden. Just don't touch this tree. Don't go near this tree. That was it. That's the only rule he put upon these guys to have everything they could ever want inside the garden. Let's um, let's head over to chapter three. Chapter three, and we're going to pick it up at verse one. And I'm going to read down to verse 13. Okay, so this is some time onwards. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die or in fear that you die. And the serpent said unto woman, the serpent, of course, representing Satan here, or being Satan here, said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the, the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, 
and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat as well. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig, uh, fig leaves together and made themselves some aprons or some coverings. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Verse 11. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest should not eat and the man said pointing the finger straight away the man said the woman whom thou gavest to be with me she gave me of the tree and i did eat and the lord god said unto the woman what is this that thou hast done and the woman said the serpent beguiled or tricked me and i did eat now let's flip down to verse 16 This is after God has met them in the garden and they have confessed their sins to God. And this is how God's going to deal with them now. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy, and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. Unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy fa face, not faith, face, shalt thou eat bread till thy return onto the ground. For out of it uh, wast thou come, and for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And we'll just quickly flip down to 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So Adam and Eve peacefully living in the garden with everything given to them, given to them by God. Wonderful place to live. And then along comes this, this snake or serpent uh, that, you know, stood out for the rest of them. Wasn't like the rest of the animals, you know, who just, ate the grass and drank of the water and, um, you know, kind of minded their own business if they were left alone. This snake had a bit of an intellect that it could hold a that you could hold a conversation with. It tells a lie to Eve who at this stage, and, you know, had only known what God had told her and only knew what God had given her. Uh, this was, of course, the introduction of sinful men and their want to be disobedient to God. God set this up to test men to see how obedient they would be to his name or to his, to his word, to his instructions. Being spirit filled, we are now that temple of God and together we are the body of Christ. Like Adam and Eve, we have been placed uh, in a place of protection. Uh, the kingdom of God is our modern day Garden of Eden, you know, where we don't have to worry about, uh, uh, about the food, about water, because God promised that he would supply all of that to us. It's ours for the taking. All we have to do is be faithful to God. And being faithful is trusting and believing in God. That's what faithfulness is. Trusting God in any situation that he is the almighty. 
and he will come through on his promises as our brother just testified of the Lord's protection. That's what faithfulness is. Being full of trust and loyalty to the God or to our God. Just as God is loyal to us, he expects us to reciprocate or return those sentiments or those emotions, those feelings. And like Adam and Eve, God has commanded that we do not partake in the world or the flesh. And when I say that word, uh, that word uh, partake, I mean in its doctrines, in its beliefs, because we all go to the supermarket and we go shopping, right? We go to the movies, et cetera, et cetera. Those things aren't of God. They're obviously of man. Man created these things. They're not of God. But um, he doesn't want us to partake in their doctrines and their beliefs. This is the reason why we need the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we're going to sin every single time. Thanks to Adam and Eve, as they turned and sinned against God, us being human, we are now destined to disobey God in that natural sense, on our own, set to our own devices, we're, we're, we're naturally inclined to disobey God. Adam and Eve were the first representatives of that. And because of that, we now are like that as well. And we will always fall short of the glory of God. You know, it's an unfortunate truth. Because I, you know, I'm part of mankind. And it hurts to know that we're not good enough to maintain our salvation alone. Without the Holy Spirit, we are powerless against the lies of this world, the deceptions of Satan. He will always try to tell us something. He will always try to disrupt us. But without the Holy Spirit, we're powerless against it, just as Eve was. Let's head over to 1 John, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. Yep, 2, 1, 2 and verse 15. Let's wait for those who are in the paper Bible. Uh, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever or will live forever. Now, the desires of the world will always be in conflict with God. That's just the nature of it. Thanks to Adam and Eve, we will always be in conflict with God. You know, the amount, the amount of temptation out there in the modern world, it's increasing rapidly at a rapid rate. Every single day, there's something new coming out. Especially when we move closer and closer to our Lord and Savior's return. You know, men, they seem to be heading in a direction where they think they no longer have need of God, that they don't need him anymore. Uh, this is why it's imperative that we draw closer to God through the Holy Spirit so that we can grow stronger in the Spirit so that we can have that ability to determine what is of God and what is of the world. That ability to discern the ability to, to figure out what is holy and what is not holy, but actually a trap set for us. At the moment, I do believe men, unfortunately, are getting ever so closer to achieving their goal in, in being able to create life or form life, because creation and formation are two completely different things. 
but they're getting closer to forming life by being able to clone creatures. You know, I read recently that they they found a fully preserved woolly mammoth that died at least either 11 or 10,000 years ago. Um, and it, it was a fully preserved intact woolly mammoth and it gave scientists access to full DNA cells. And then and apparently, and I'm no geneticist, but this allows scientists to the ability to be able to clone animals if they have intact DNA cells. But in reading the the, the article, you know, it, it would be amazing to see a full woolly mammoth out and about. Don't get me wrong. It would be amazing. It would be amazing. But yeah, I was just about to say that Jurassic Park, it's getting closer. Everyone thinks it's fiction but it's getting closer, unfortunately. Um, but could you imagine the mindset of men if they were able to achieve being able to fully clone a creature or a human for that matter? You know, why do we need God? We can, we can form life. We can create it. Why do we need him for? You know, to follow God is becoming increasingly difficult to achieve in the modern world. Homosexuality, and I'm only going to touch on it slightly, is just running amok right now in this world. You know, trying to make it okay to go against God's desire or God's will. You know, which is for men and women to be together, not the other way around. You know, well, where's the temptation in that? Well, the, the temptation is just to give in, right? Because it's running rampant, the temptation is just to give in. The old saying, if you can't beat them, join them, right? Oh, we can't beat them, so let's just give in and let's just let's just make it a thing, right? Let's just make it okay. If we say it's okay, it must be okay. We'll just scribble that bit out in the Bible. It'll be okay. You know, I've seen churches here in Victoria who have painted their steps in the colors of the rainbow, you know, and have a have writing above the door saying love is love. But we have to remember, brothers and sisters, when we do see these events occurring out there, as we watch mankind spreading across the globe, infecting every part of God's desire and will, we have to remember that God's been preparing us for this since the beginning of time. It's nothing new if you read through the scriptures. He's been telling us that this stuff is going to occur towards his return. We know the flesh are going to have their fun for now. But it's only temporary. It's only transient. It's only for a short period of time. Even the stars in the heaven have a limited time. You know, given that some of those stars can actually last for millions of years, and some of the really big ones with a mass the size of or the same as the sun can actually last for billions of years. But there is a massive reward in store for us. One that's perpetual, one that's going to outlast those stars. If we continue, only if we continue on the path that the Lord has designed and leave everything else to the Lord to deal with, to not worry about it, just to put your head down and focus on the path that he has prepared for us. You know, look at what happened to Adam and Eve, a great example. Just one moment of weakness cost them everything. A small moment in time cost them everything that they had. You know, and now men have to, to now work very hard in the field to cultivate or, or grow their stock to feed their family or work very long hours women now have to go through agony or severe pain just to, to to give birth to a child because of that one moment that one moment in time that cost adam and eve everything let's spin across to isaiah please this will be my closing scripture Uh, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 19. 
Okay, so if ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and repel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Great scripture, powerful scripture. For us to give in to the temptations as Eve did and Adam did, to give in to the, to the flesh, to the desires and plans of this world, it's the end game. We will lose our salvation, period. We will be thrown out of the Garden of Eden, like Adam and Eve were. We will be thrown out of the kingdom. And we will find ourselves in a position of looking from the outside in, looking at what we gave up, what we had in the palm of our hands. You know, the Bible says that in the last day, there will be gnashing of teeth. That's a grinding of teeth. Maybe because of the anguish, the heartache or the heartbreak of missing out, of knowing what they gave up just to have their moments of fun. Maybe that's where the gnashing of teeth will come from. Just that painful agony of going, it's over for me. You know, but all have fallen short of the glory of, of the Lord. But through God, we have overcome the blood of Jesus that he made it possible to receive the Holy Ghost and fire so that our sins could be erased for the uh, remission of sins, erased, never to be remembered again. And that any moment we would have the strength and the tenacity to look the temptation in the eye and say, flee. And the Spirit gives us this ability because it gives us the knowledge and the understanding of what we have, what we've been given by God, just as Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden, given everything. The Holy Spirit reminds us every day, if we look to it, of what we were given by God through the Holy Spirit. And uh, the Holy Spirit gives us that intimate knowledge of what we'll have in the end of the day if we if we um, uh, give up these temptations and tell them to get lost. And we can never lose sight of that. We can never lose sight of what we have in the Lord. So we can remain in that kingdom of God. And uh, we can hear those good words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And I'll leave it there.